Today we are visiting with Carrie Keating, who is a professor at Colgate University, and as I said, my favorite and uh, first professor, the one that got me out of chemistry. Because <laughs> I always tell the story about being in chemistry class and saying, I'm tired of experiments I already know the answer to. <laughs> it was just about skill building, and what I wanted to do was find the answers to questions people hadn't yet. And so uh, Carrie was the one that turned me on to psychology, and I have never looked back, I think it's fair to say. Well, there's not a more difficult subject that you could have chosen <laughs> than leadership, and political leadership in particular. Yeah, and so why don't we start with you telling us your background? Well, I am a social psychologist. I also study development and cross-cultural psychology. I'm a nonverbal communication expert, so watch out. <laughs> um, I am fascinated by leadership because leaders, if you think about their job, their job is to move people. Yes. That's really what a leader does. It's that simple and it's that complex. And so the skill set you need to be able to move people toward a goal, a shared goal, that is going to make it a better world for them and a better world for everyone, that is quite a challenge. It is, and actually as you're saying that, it makes me think about um, one of the concepts we talked a lot about in military, was the difference between having a similar or homogeneous culture and having one that's full of diversity. So in uh, NATO, we work with 28 different nations, most of them, or all of them, much smaller than our own. And they would often say, why doesn't America just do this? Why, why doesn't the United States just act this way or that way? And I would frequently say, your culture is very different than ours. The leadership requirements there are very different than the leadership requirements in a country, A, is large, but B, that celebrates diversity. Do you see some of those differences yeah. in the, the leadership? Piece? Yes, the, the exciting thing about that is, is that cultures are dynamic. Yes. They change. Yes. Uh, the food we eat now is not the food that your mother served or your grandmother served when in the 50s. Right. Uh, it, it, we are open to new ideas and we can take the best ideas from other cultures and integrate them with our ideas and share our great ideas with other cultures. And so a lot of leadership, I think, is learning. Interesting. Yeah. How so? I teach, you know, I teach a course in, in leadership and it's very popular. Um, and one of the things we emphasize is that if you're not willing to learn, then you'll never make a good leader. Mm. Because leadership itself is dynamic. The groups of people uh, who you deal with have different needs, wants, desires. You have to be able to pick up on all of that. And you have to be able to figure it out when they're at variance with each other. So it's a real difficult task. And it takes a lot of learning and listening as well as speaking. And a lot of our politicians are better speakers than they are listeners. Well, that was where my head was <laughs> definitely going. I thought, okay, so now if I think through some of the uh, points that we, we observe in politicians, we don't, we don't hear a lot of listening. We don't. But, and that's, we are partly to blame for that. I think that's fair. How it so? It is fair. <laughs> we are partly to blame for that because we put them on a stage in a debate situation that really isn't very successful if you really want to get to know a person or know what they're thinking or know what their capacities are or know if they're interested in you, we put them in situations which don't allow for much of that. So it's good in the primaries, I think especially on the Democratic side, um, that there will be these small venues in New Hampshire and in Iowa where people actually get to know, get a sense of the soul of the person who they're dealing with. So maybe they get to know the soul. Do they get to know their problem-solving skills or their leadership skills? Or are we still learning just in a smaller space their speaking skills? I think we get to know some of their skills, okay. some of okay. their interpersonal skills. But I also think that we don't get to see their knowledge enough. How would we see it? Well, I think in particular, if you actually, we, we did this in one of our experiments. Okay. We were interested in finding female politicians who were speaking about foreign issues, foreign uh, security issues. And we also needed them to be standing, because it turns out that when male politicians talk about foreign affairs, they're usually standing. We had trouble finding females who were standing up speaking about foreign issues, international politics. Defense. So would they be sitting, or they just the, the videos were just absent? 
The videos were absent frequently, mm -hmm. and if we could find them, they were often sitting. So the command, the authority oh, yeah. that you, that message that you get from watching how they behave and what they talk about, yeah. it's lacking for women. Actually, Christian Gillibrand was one of the few who we could find who was standing and talking about defense issues. So I'm curious, why, why do you think it is that they don't stand? Uh, I don't know, but I can say that there is, of course, as we all know, very subtle biases right. that still operate and that still undermine our female candidates. I feel like I must have done somewhat of a good job as a professor because you're here talking to me about these issues, and I'm very excited about that. Well, and, and I'm out of uniform. <laughs> yes, I am deliberately out of uniform, actually. That's why a lot of times I, I always wore dresses in the Pentagon, and I wanted to determine, would someone take me seriously? I mean, it's always appropriate dress, never that. Um, but I was curious that I need to wear the uniform. I mean, I actually have colleagues who have mm. um, massive chronic headaches from wearing their hair in too tight of a bun. Yeah. And certainly our active duty personnel have to do that, but those of us who are civilian, certainly not a requirement, but an unwritten expectation that you'll wear black or navy and that you will have your hair in a severe bun. Yeah. And I decided as the director of innovation right. that I was going to innovate in, in, in all ways. Yeah. And one of them was to dress as, as I would, yes. professional, but still feminine, yeah. um, and I'm pleased to say that I n never had an issue and encouraged a lot of other women to <laughs> break out of the mold, and we did. We saw color, we saw energy come into yeah. the space. Um, Do you so know it's interesting. You know what I think, um, if, if we could fix and tinker with our society, uh, and this was an idea that was expressed to me by um, a 50s mom, actually, years and years ago, she said, you know, the problem with the world is that we don't value things feminine enough. Mm. And so the way one dresses, the way one acts, the way one wears their hair or the kind of shoes they wear, those uh, traditions are generally masculine because when you think of masculine traits, mm -hmm. they are strength, they are square jawedness, they are... Uh, well put together, they are muscular, they are assertive, they are aggressive. All of those masculine ideals overlap quite easily with our construal of leadership. So we have a masculine construal of leadership. Feminine things, we think of gentleness, kindness, compassion, don't overlap with the way we see leadership. But that is wrong. That is what's wrong. It's leadership that needs to change, not femininity. Wow, or just digest that for a moment, right? It's, that's a big, it's that's a big, a big idea. statement. Yes. It's staring us in the face. It's like a mural on the wall that's always been there for centuries, which has been one of the reasons why we, it's difficult. It's a challenge for women to step up to leadership. We've been too close to that mural, and I think in now this Me Too moment, we've stepped back. And I think we're beginning to recognize that things feminine, feminine values are good values. And actually, you know, the LGBTQ community, um, they have helped express these ideas. Yeah. So that kind of diversity, I think, helps us value um, things more widely yes. than we have in the past. Yes. Yeah, I, I, um, I do unusual things every so often. And one of the things that I... I did was really just kind of step back and see who are the female leaders and and what are some of the tendencies one of the tendencies and again part of the reason i just i dress as i am comfortable is that i always saw uh, suits and shoulder pads and i said you know at some point it's it's less about a uniform uniform like a, a, mm -hmm. a, a um, non-gender biased uniform mm. and it's more about us dressing like men in order to be able to stand on stage Correct. and i said i, I really I believe there is an opportunity to be strong. I mean, I, I worked military, so I certainly was standing on stage <laughs> discussing these things all the time, um, and in, in foreign spaces, and, and it, it was never an issue to be just myself as long as the quality of the message was strong. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I noticed is I would stand in front of the airports when I would, or the bookstores at the airports, and I would take pictures of all the, the books on the shelf, but stepping back. 
and I would say, what, what do you see? And I would send it to some of the people on my team and say, tell me what you see. And what we always saw, whenever there was a female that was in a leadership book, she was leaning forward, she was in your face, and she was, it had the word fight in it somewhere. And I thought, is it a requirement? Is it a requirement for a female leader to be a fighter in that kind of aggressive stance? Mm. Not a requirement, but I know some of the data that w has been collected by not just my lab, yeah. but others. Yeah. Um, those status cues, the status cues that surround us play an, a particularly important role for women. Mm -hmm. So when women are sitting down, that speaks more loudly about sitting down mm -hmm. and not being the authority figure than it does for men. Any of the cues of a room, the formality of a room, the formality of dress, the formality of the you know venue, um, the pageantry, mm. uh, those status cues do help women be perceived, perceived mm. as more dominant, higher status, more authoritative. Sadly, but well, you just need to know if that's what it, you yeah. need to know it. Yeah. yeah. So the military wasn't kidding around. They gave you that uniform and told you to wear it. <laughs> they actually probably knew that it was going to give you a boost because we're still locked into that more masculine construal of leadership. Well, I, I will say it was actually discussed. So I did not serve them. Just to be clear on that, I. I I've always been a civilian, but um, there is always this expectation of black and navy. And so right. for me to walk in in a bright orange dress or, or a yellow lace right. dress uh, definitely was was different. Um, and so I would sometimes ask in places where, where we could have those right. discussions. And always it was pleased to see different opinions, pleased to see um, yeah. positions. But I also come in with authority. Right, I came in at, at, uh, as a doctor. I come in with lots of experience. Mm -hmm. So the minute, um, and, and you were in a certain rank in the government mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I did not have the issues that I thought, and I thought, I think that's a change. Right. I think that's a real change. And it's an interesting change, because one of the values that's important in the military is that it's a team. Yes. And so to stand out too much as an individual, Yes kind of rubs against that value of communal, we're all in this together, I've got your back, you have mine. Yeah. No one stands above another unless it's in a formal hierarchical system. Yeah. Not the same in the Pentagon though. Yeah. Because everyone's of a certain rank. And, and their so the reaction teams yeah. are now different. The way we fight is a little bit different. It's a lot. Now leaders have to be ready to switch roles. Yes. So so it's no longer this formal hierarchy. Yes. And we see that working itself out, not just in the military, but also in business. Well, and I think those are some of the questions that have started to come up. Um, in the leadership space, the question starts to be, really, how do we get to mission success? Which in the past was, we are a homogeneous team working together because we need that uh, human power. Now, there's a recognition that there are multiple skill sets that we need, mm -hmm. right? We need those cognitive assets, we need those physical assets, we need people who think differently because sometimes our adversaries are thinking differently too. And when we bring all that to the table, we're seeing a broader yeah, appreciation mm -hmm. um, for differences. And mm -hmm. yeah, some of the work that we did was looking at rapid team formation yes. and recognizing you didn't just grab what we call the warm body, right? We, right. we sp specifically not only look for specialists, but specialists that can work together. Right. So I, I, I think that, or at least my observation, certainly I'll say, say this with authority, is that there is a trend of change in the military and a recognition um, that, like you said, that agility right. matters. Right. Yeah. Oh, very much so. Very much. Yeah. And being able to get along with people. Because the other thing yes. about leadership is yes. that leadership is not just about uh, moving people. It is. Right? And it's not just about learning. It's also a relationship. When you think yes. about it, you can't be a leader without followers. Yes. And the more modern way to think about leadership is that it is a relationship between a leader and people. Mm -hmm. And what you need to be a leader, you need those relationship building skills. So interesting point on that. If the goal of the leader, say at the president cabinet level, mm -hmm. is to be connected to those they're working with, right? 
how is it that someone who comes in from outsiders, never served in the executive branch of the government, would have all those relationships with the, I don't know if a lot of people don't realize, there are 4.5 million workers, if we include both uh, the 14 departments plus DOD and all our active duty mm -hmm. and reserve personnel. Four and a half million people. And almost nobody comes into office that has ever worked with any of them. Right. How would we as Americans judge somebody able to make those relationships and be able to even make sense of that large of a space? You know, it's difficult to judge. You know, that what everyone seeks in a leader is authenticity. Does that leader really want to know what I'm thinking and what yeah. I'm feeling? Do they have my interests and the group's interests at heart? Or do they have only their own interests at heart? So I think yeah. uh, we have uh, all these tests that we do, most of them based on nonverbal communication, not verbal. Mm -hmm. Because it's not so much the words that leaders say, it's the way they say them. That, that is the loved Obama's um, the oratory skills. Yes, absolutely. And those oratory skills were on full display early in his career. Yeah. No one will ever forget that wonderful uh, speech he gave to the Democratic Convention about no red and no blue states, it's rural purple. It was such a moving speech, and uh, I think as his uh, tenure went on in the White House, he got more and more cautious and a little bit less charismatic and not as good at conveying the messages that he needed to get out to the American people. Any idea why? Oh, I think you get cautious in politics. I think you're afraid to be the authentic you because we're very hard on authentic people, although some people get away with it. The current administration, in a sense, mm -hmm. um, I think Donald Trump is who he is. What you see is what you get. I suppose that's a version of authenticity. Had you turned off the volume during the Republican uh, primaries, in 2016, had you turned off the volume and looked at the stage and asked anyone, probably a five-year-old, who was going to win the election, they would have all pointed to Donald Trump. He had the nonverbal skills to stand out from that crowd and look like a leader. If you had asked anyone who of the Republicans' candidates on that stage looks like a general, looks like a leader, looks like the dominant person, all would have pointed to Donald Trump. Wow. But you had to have the volume <laughs> <laughs> and I turn the volume off all the time. I'm really a terrible person when it comes to politicians because I don't much listen to what they say. I only look at how they move and how they gesture. When well, they and, and that's, I, mean, I think that's common, actually. Yes. Um, right? And so yeah. their question often comes in, what is it that people are making their judgments on? And, and a lot of discussion right now says, are we making it based on data and facts? Or do they not matter at all and it's simply perception? It's very scary. Good for my business because it's what I said. <laughs> yes. But I got to tell you, JJ, it's, it's been interesting to me to see how um, the nonverbal communication, even the, the physical presence of a person, how square their jaw is, how big a person they are, their posture, how they stand, all of those things make someone look like a leader. And when someone looks like a leader, we start to treat them like a leader. We think mm -hmm. of them as a leader. They, they fit with our construal of leadership, even when they're not especially skillful at leading. But they still can get our vote. In fact, there's been research done that shows that you can predict something like 65, maybe even 70% of the time, who's going to win an election just by showing the two candidates' faces, one with the other, and asking almost anyone who do you think's going to be the winner. Like 65% of the time or so, they pick the person. So is that successful? Wins. Or are we using the wrong metrics? Uh, I think it's a, if that's the only metric you've got, we're in trouble. <laughs> it concerns, concerns me. I mean, that's kind of where my head was going was, okay, yeah. so are we more doomed than we think? Or is there a possibility to change the discussion? Our evolutionary history has led us to be the kind of organisms that still judge one another face-to-face. Yeah, we yeah. still do this face-to-face -face litmus test the way yeah. we interact with people, the way we form relationships, and it's not bad. It's just that it turns out that some people are very good at putting on a face that they actually don't feel. Yes. So we're 
At the same time, we're trying to use these nonverbal cues. We're not actually very good at judging which cues can be deceptive and lead us down the wrong, wrong road. Gotcha. And in research in our own lab that you're very familiar yeah. with, I know, uh, we found that politicians, leaders, even everyday leaders, um, are particularly good, even among small children, they're particularly good at conning or misleading others if they're higher in the dominance hierarchy. Wow. So dominant people seem to have these skill sets that allow them to be dishonest when they're asked to be. It, it doesn't mean that they're more dishonest than most people. I've never tested that. I don't know if they are or they're not. It's just that when they're called upon to mislead, they have better acting skills to do it. Wow. They fool us more than time. Mm -hmm. So when my, my children were young, we would watch um, the, uh, the, the, the Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. And the one that came out where they had um, Obi-Wan and the Chancellor trying to talk to Anakin. And they both were acting as father figures in this movie. And one was obviously looking out for him, and the other was looking out for himself and trying to use Anakin to his advantage. And I remember having my kids, I remember Rich being like five and saying, how do you tell the difference? How do you listen to these two authorities in your, you know, if, if you're him, listen to these, how would you pick it apart? And it was very interesting to watch him try and figure out like, how would you? Because much of what they said, if you didn't know the full story, looked and acted and felt and sounded and moved yeah. like somebody that cared about you. Yeah. But we know only one did. Yeah. And so this was my way of helping them to <laughs> determine, right, right um, in a safe space, mm -hmm. how would you distinguish those that are looking out for you versus those that are just acting like it? Mm -hmm. So I pose the question to you similarly. Uh, just to close this out, um, if voters could pick two things that they could do better to have on their scorecard to be able to distinguish between those that are authentic and their interest in helping you and those that are reading it from a script. Yeah. The nonverbal cues will tell you something, okay? But they won't tell you everything. And that's because there's one, boy, potentially disruptive trait that we have as human beings. Leaders have it, we all have it, and it's self-deception. So to the degree that a leader believes their own lies, they will come across as amazingly authentic. Hmm. So how do you know, how can you judge? You've gotta go back to the facts and compare facts to performance. In the end, it's not just style, it's substance. So if you've got, for example, a climate denier, and they look very convincing as they tell you that it's fine to keep taking fuel out of the ground, then that person may look very authentic in their belief system because in fact they have gotten themselves to the believe it too. Mm. So self-deception de self is this tendency we have to lie to ourselves, to believe our own lies to have two cognitive thoughts. You know about this, yes. you're a cognitive psychologist. Two thoughts, and one you suppress it. You never really get rid of it, but it gets filtered from consciousness. If that belief, whoa, climate change may be an issue, can be filtered from, con from consciousness, then you can be all the more convincing and compelling when you give a speech this on why it doesn't matter. This is scary, what you're saying. It is, yes. This is my next uh, set of, of experiments that we've tried to look at that. Yeah. And the people who come across as most charismatic actually register in your brain differently. Interesting. Tell me. So. We now have evidence that the charismatic leader, who are the most powerful leaders, they're the leaders we will, we will give up Mm -hmm. resources for. They're the leaders we work hardest for. They're the people who can move us most dramatically, hopefully toward good things, but not always good things. Mm -hmm. Charisma is like a lot of other forces. Yeah. <laughs> it can be used for, for good or for ill. Yeah. Those charismatic leaders trigger not only our approach system, but also our avoidance system. They have just the right balance of bringing us toward 
them so that we follow them, but also keeping us at distance a little bit so we can't quite see their face. Mm. We can't quite get to know them, but we know that they're formidable. So it's like Oz. It is a little like Oz, but it's definitely uh, these two components of yeah. come here but beware. So you can get close, but not too close. Those are the powerful forms of leadership we call charismatic. And here's the other little factor that's so dangerous, and that is that in times of distress and trouble, people are more likely to have a thirst, a hunger, a desire for a charismatic leader. And of course, depending on the leader, that can lead to terrible things, or wonderful things, right. either way. But it's something that people should be aware of, because we are cognitively, emotionally, and socially vulnerable to charismatic leaders when there is a sense of urgency, a sense of concern, mm -hmm. And we feel that now. We do feel that now about a number of things. Right. About the changing demographics of our country. Yeah. The economy's working for some, not all. The climate is changing. People can feel it now. Mm -hmm. They see that. So the state of anxiety and distress that we're in leaves us very vulnerable to charismatic leaders. We better be <laughs> selecting the right leader because if we're led in the wrong direction, it could be very bad. Wow. Well, that's as uh, poignant as we can get. It sounds like, <laughs> <laughs> check your own bias, check the facts. Yeah. Make your own decision. Right. Yeah, because if not, then then you're led astray. Or it can be led astray, I think is the right be. answer, right? Yes. Um, I often say uh, about weapons, weapons can be used to defend or to cause harm, and sometimes it's difficult to know which. Right. And then it's the same thing. We can be led astray or we can be led to a right. great place. Um, right. But underlying, there is a truth. Mm -hmm. We just have to find it. Yes. And that requires some investigation that's hard to do right now. <laughs> so I, I think this is a to-be-continued conversation. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and thank you for joining us online. We will be sure to post this on our YouTube channel as well so you can rewatch it later. Have a great Sunday.